When I moved to Washington, D.C. to work in the Clinton administration, I bought a row house on Capitol Hill. But in the summer, even with air conditioning on full blast, it got so hot that I had to move from my bedroom on the third floor down a floor. And eventually, I got sick of this. So I climbed up onto the roof to see what could be done. The roof was completely black. And standing there, my feet got so hot that I had to jump up and down. So I did some research. And I found that black roofs only reflect 10% of the light and absorbs the other 90%, turns it into radiant heat that heated up my shoes, my bedroom, and the neighborhood. And I learned that because of our dark surfaces, our dark roads, our dark roofs, our dark parking lots, our cities are eight degrees hotter in the summertime, and that this is called the urban heat island effect. Now, this is crazy, because our ancestors moved to cities to begin with to live in places that were more livable. I also learned that a way to make my bedroom cooler is to increase my albedo. Not libido, albedo. <laughs> and it's a good to have a high albedo if you're a surface, because a surface is a measure of reflectivity. And it turns out if you're a 95-year-old man, you can have a really high albedo. It just has to be on your roof. So I researched, I bought a five-gallon bucket of paint and a brush. I climbed up onto my roof, I rolled out the paint. Two days later, it got very hot and sunny. My top floor did not get too hot, and I could stay in my bedroom all summer long, even without the air conditioning on. Before I painted my roof, it absorbed 90% of sunlight heating up the building and the neighborhood around it. But with my high albedo paint, most of the sunlight bounced back into the sky and out of the atmosphere, literally cooling our planet. Some of you have probably walked on dark surfaces, a parking lot or a road, and felt that radiant heat pouring up off it. And maybe you thought, gosh, I could fry an egg on that. Well, you can. Dark surfaces like roads get to 170 degrees. Eggs start frying at 158 degrees. And you know something's wrong with your surfaces, or one of the fastest growth areas in pet supplies is special shoes for dogs who can't handle the extreme heat of the surfaces that we've covered our cities in. Dark surfaces absorb heat and re-radiate it during the day and also at night. So not only is it hotter during the day, it's also much hotter at night, and that means that our bodies cannot cool down. And this results in a phenomenon called urban heat deaths. In Europe, one three-day heat event killed 55,000 people. And the threat of heat deaths is not just limited to areas that traditionally get hot. Russia had one multi-day heat event that killed 50,000 people. Last year, it got to 112 degrees in Portland, Oregon. And this summer, London has experienced the temperature of the Sahara. This is not something that Londoners are used to. But we are the lucky ones. National Academy of Sciences study found that 300 million people are living in areas that are projected to be so hot by 2040 that they will not be able to survive extreme heat events, 300 million people living in areas that are going to have heat events so extreme, humans cannot survive. So what's the solution today? Our solution is more air conditioning. The problem with air conditioning is it works by making the inside cool and the outside hot. So it can heat the city by two degrees. Plus, air conditioners require power to operate. That means power plants that generate CO2. And air conditioners use as coolants greenhouse gases that are powerful greenhouse gases and that they regularly leak. So we can't rely on air conditioning for cooling. And think about this. In places like India, only 8% of city dwellers can actually afford air conditioning. And air conditioning fails regularly, particularly when it's hot out and when there's highest AC usage. And so we have a situation where we're making our cities hotter with air conditioning, 
where our reliance on air conditions accelerates heat and global warming, and where large portions of the population can't afford air conditioning, and if they can, it's most likely to fail when the power is at greatest demand, which is air conditioning load as large as. This is kind of a Dante's Inferno. Temperature is not equally distributed in cities. What you have here is a map of Philadelphia showing temperature and income. And as you can see, temperature and income are highly inversely correlated. It is 15 degrees hotter in the summer in low-income minority areas in many or most American cities because those are dark surfaces, dark roads, and relatively few trees. This is the direct result of city investments in surfaces, which are underinvestment in trees in low-income areas and dark, impervious surfaces. In Dallas, the difference between high-income, mostly white communities, and lower-income minority communities can be over 20 degrees. I want you to imagine something. Imagine you have to raise your child or your children in a community that's 15 degrees hotter, with few trees for shade, little green impervious surfaces, so a lot more flooding, which means more mold, more asthma, more allergy, worse air pollution, and increased risk of heat deaths. That's where 50 million people live and where children are raised. This means that unequal surfaces means unequal lives. And this should be unacceptable in any city. Recently, walking around D.C. with 25 inner-city kids, I was explaining to them how these surfaces worked and how you could take a dark surface and make it more reflective, an impervious surface and make it more porous. One 16-year-old student stopped, he looked around, and he said, these are stupid surfaces. It's an assessment that's hard to argue with. On the left-hand side is a dark road in shade, and on the right, you have that same dark road in full-on sun. That heat meter tells you that it's 105 degree surface temperature on the road that's shaded, and on the right, 150 degrees measured surface temperature. When a dark surface heats up, it gets hot, it expands, in the day, it contracts at night, and the next day it expands, and then it contracts. And that means it cracks faster, which means it has to be replaced sooner, and that costs money. So reflective surfaces over their life cost less than highly absorptive surfaces. One of the solutions is to resurface rows. We raised funding for an initiative that now has 20 cities and towns resurfacing dark roads. In this picture, you can see resurfacing. It increases the reflectivity by about threefold. And that means measured temperature in the residential buildings on either side of the road drops by one or two degrees. One or two degrees is good. If average summer mean temperature goes up by one degree, it increases likelihood of heat death by 250%. So a degree or two is quite a lot, but it's simply not enough. We also have to plant a lot more trees. We're working now at the Harvard Graduate School of Design, quantifying the benefits and impacts of putting in miles of linear urban forests into cities. We're able to quantify large benefits in reduced energy bills, reduce water and wastewater costs, and health benefits. But how do you quantify the benefit of making sure that every city kid can have a tree fort? or can go out and look at butterflies, or that every city kid can learn to love the sound of the voices of songbirds. In addition to more reflective surfaces and more trees, we need more bioswales to capture water, put it back in the ground, and grow greenery to cool the cities. We need more solar PV to provide clean power and provide shading. And when you add trees to bioswales and reflective surfaces, you can achieve very large reductions in temperature. When you add all these elements of smart surfaces up, you're looking at making a city feel 15 degrees cooler in the summer. You have lower ambient temperature, less radiant heat coming off the dark surfaces. You have shade, and you have better air quality. 
15 degrees cooler is the difference between summer misery and summer outdoors, between being outside playing and enjoying yourself or being stuck inside in air conditioning. The great Jane Jacobs, in her seminal book, The Death and Life of Great American Cities, talks about a key part of what makes a city vibrant, and she calls it eyes on the street. When cities are cooler, you have a lot more eyes on the street. That means less crime, more time outdoors, gardening, exercising, biking, being neighborly, and being part of a vibrant neighborhood. And of course, outdoor activity, biking, exercising, walking, affects obesity, diabetes, and our enormous health bills. If you want to, as a city manager, attract young talent, or investors, or new corporations to move in, or tourists, this is how you do it. We've built a coalition called the Smart Surfaces Coalition. It's a not-for-profit made up of 40 organizations like the American Institute of Architects, the American Planning Association, Habitat for Humanity. Our steering committee includes the executive director of the American Public Health Association all the way to the president of the World Cement Association. And what we do is we work with cities to build highly detailed, accurate cost-benefit models of the entire surface of the city. So the city can ask what-if questions, run hundreds of scenarios, and understand where to intervene. Where do you put in a reflective surface? Where do you put in a reflective road? Where do you put in a porous surface? And this allows cities to understand what their future can look like and how they shape it. We're working in the US, and we're just starting to work in India. One of the cities we're working in is Baltimore. Baltimore's measured difference in summer temperature between wealthy sections like Rollins Park or low-income minority sections is 14 degrees in the summer. In the modeling we did with them, we found that citywide adoption of smart surfaces would cool downtown by five degrees and low-income areas by seven to eight degrees. It would also save the city money, a lot of money, $13 billion, which translates into about $20,000 per citizen. And it would cut the global warming impact of Baltimore as a whole by 15 to 20 percent. I'm incredibly proud to say that Baltimore is, through a series of bills, many of which have passed, adopting smart surfaces across the entire city and reshaping the city livability and its future for its citizens. We know that air conditioning cannot be our answer to heat. We know that air conditioning dumps a lot of heat outside. We know that air conditioning requires enormous amount of power, which is responsible for a rapidly growing part of accelerating global warming. We know that air conditioning has greenhouse gases, which leak regularly. And we know that a large portion of the population cannot and never will be able to afford air conditioning. The answer has to be citywide smart surfaces, substituting private investments in air conditioning that heats up everybody else to public investments and private investments in citywide cooling strategies. That is the only way that we can avoid mass urban heat deaths. It is the only way we can finally deal with the structural racial inequality that has plagued our cities for far too long. And it's the only way to make our public spaces vibrant, outdoor, joyous places all summer long. When I chose a high albedo for my roof many years ago, there were relatively few options. Today, there are many hundreds of very cost-effective, commercially available smart surfaces. Please join us in the smart surface effort. If you know anybody who works in city government or government, tell them we have to move from stupid surfaces to smart surfaces. This is something we can do if we do it together. Let's get it done. Thank you.